Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Ritchie. I'm your chair for this session. Uh, I'm with MRA Consulting. We've got a great uh, cast of speakers here today to talk about uh, the topic of CDL. The topic is now New South Wales Container Deposit Scheme, how it will affect you. Can I get a show of hands? Who's from local government? Wow. OK. <laughs> I guess there's going to be a bias in terms of interpretation of where to from here. Uh, by way of background, the federal government uh, undertook a, uh, a RIS a discussion paper on uh, container deposits uh, done by PricewaterhouseCoopers a few years ago. Then there was a decision RIS, which was done by Mark, Marsden Jacobs. Uh, and as I understand it from some of our eminent speakers uh, this morning, Minister Hunt said, late last year, we can't get agreement across the states, so we'll leave it to the states to make their own decisions. You'll be aware that Northern Territory a couple of years ago introduced their own CDL scheme. That fell over in, the, I think, the federal court because it uh, didn't recognise the Mutual Recognition Act, and that set some precedents about the way states negotiate and introduce schemes that affect cross-border transactions. So the Northern Territory scheme fell over. The South Australian scheme, of course, predated the Mutual Recognition Act, so it survives. Uh, and the New South Wales government, as you'll be aware, the minister last year uh, said our preference is for moving towards a container deposit scheme. Uh, he said that in December last year. Uh, the Baird government reinforced that by saying it was committed to a container deposit scheme in. February this year, and as I understand it, in March this year, the Labor opposition said they would give bipartisan support to a container deposit scheme. But we have Steve Beeman here to clarify all of the issues in respect of where we're up to in the CDL debate. Uh, and for the format this morning, uh, we're going to ask each of our speakers to speak for three or four minutes, introduce the concept, and then open the floor uh, to questions. We are extending the time till 10 past 11. Uh, so any of you who wanted to go across the road to the Clean Energy Regulator, that'll also be commencing at 10 past 11. So don't stress at the end of this session. And can I just quickly make a plug for the Waste Aid donations? There are baskets out there for donating to Waste Aid, which is a very good cause. That saves me doing it at the end. So if I can now turn to our speakers list, we'll follow the, uh, we'll follow the format. Our first speaker is Grant Musgrave. Grant is the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Council of Recyclers, ACOR. Uh, and uh, Grant has had a long history in this debate. And uh, please join with me in welcoming Grant to the stage. Uh, thanks, Mike. This might take a little longer than three minutes. My apologies. I thought we were here for about an hour and a half, so we'll see how we go. Um, I stand before you this morning with a bit of a moral dilemma. Um, between uh, my duty as a CEO in a member-based organisation um, and the level of information I give to them, uh, and there are some excellent members in the room, and then the level of information which I give to you all. I'll tell you most of everything, but perhaps not everything, um, just to be up front. So uh, on New Year's Eve, I was in New Zealand at about five o'clock riding a horse back into a little country town, and I felt uh, an email come in on my phone, and I thought, who would send an email on New Year's Eve? They're either mad or it's very important. I pulled out my phone, stopped the horse, and it was from... Uh, the New South Wales Minister's Office, um, with a letter attached from, from Rob, Rob Stokes, the then Minister. And it said, we're going to have uh, 800 reverse feeding machines, and we're going to do it all by 2017. Told my horse to hurry up. <laughs> it really was a man on the moon moment, or perhaps a, a man on the Mars moment. Uh, I, re I remember it distinctly, because I was just trying to process uh, the, the amount of work that needs to be done to achieve what was a very, very clear commitment um, by, by the government and uh, indeed the Premier himself. It can be done. There are 40 uh, deposit schemes around the world. It's not new. Uh, it's not radical. One of the first things I did uh, as a guest of the German government was uh, to go to Germany to look at uh, what is reputedly 
Uh, from a resource recovery uh, perspective, the best system in the world, that is you get about 98.5 per cent of resources uh, recovered. And uh, that was uh, certainly interesting. I learned a lot. Where they are and where we are is a very, very long journey. Uh, the process uh, uh, is urgent. I'm sure Steve um, uh, feels that deeply. We've got, got all the processes of government, the cabinet process. You've got uh, consultation or not. If you're going to put a man on Mars by 2017, maybe you just do it. The to-do list is long. Here's a brief overview of what needs to be done, and that's before you actually start wheeling out a system. You need to determine the scope of the legislation. Uh, you need to work out what the targets and penalties are. You need to define the deposit value, although I understand that's been done. You need to determine very precisely what containers are covered and what aren't. Uh, you need to uh, devise and specify the multiple points of return, uh, handling fees, uh, organisational structures and governance, the logistics system, very substantial, uh, and of course behaviour change, education and uh, uh, community education and expectations. Now in terms of the issues, whether you're uh, running a, uh, a MRF or uh, a, a, you're all obviously stakeholders in some sense, whether you're a local government or a private sector MRF, um, we are talking about a complete restructure of a long established supply chain, a multi-billion dollar supply chain. Uh, I was over in uh, Vancouver, and in North America, they have a lot of uh, container deposit schemes throughout Canada. Uh, but there's also, there there's a, a, a what they call a dematerialisation lobby group. Now that is a, a, a multi-material lobby group. That is, they advocate against using all the things we regard as standard packaging. They, they advocate for all of these highly complex nanomaterials that are 100% not recyclable anywhere in the world. Uh, so one of the impacts of this could be from big beverage, for example, may not want to use aluminium cans anymore. They may, or they may want to put food in pouches rather than other, other, other container types. Other potential issues that need to be uh, thought about uh, uh, is uh, the potential for stranded assets. If you've got uh, equipment as part of your processing system, whatever it is that's there to, there to pull out uh, aluminium and, pl aluminium and uh, plastics, they're valuable. Now, if they're not coming through uh, your system and going through uh, a reverse vending machine slash CDS system, uh, there's there's a real potential for for, uh, for for substantial and irreversible monetary loss. One minute. <laughs> Redemption of uh, pulling glass out is something which I find really appealing, because glass has become an absolute scourge of a liability to uh, both the, the private sector uh, and the public sector. That's one of the, one of the real potential uh, uh, benefits, but it needs to be colour sorted um, to have any value. Um, fraud, I was concerned about that, but having seen the German system, I'm not. The barcoding and optical sorting systems deal with that in a very comprehensive way. Uh, and finally, politics. We've got to send this, this man to Mars. Uh, it's probably man called Steve Beeman, uh, <laughs> or maybe it's ground control, I'm not sure which, um, by 2017 and have a v very, very difficult conversation with, with Big Beverage, who are implacably opposed to this. Uh, and it really depends on your interpretation of the announcements. Uh, I can certainly tell you that Big Beverage interpreted as 800 standalone reverse vending machines whilst others interpret it as a full-blown German-style CDS system. Um, and the devil will be very much in the detail, and the detail needs to be dealt with very, very quickly. That's great. Some of you may be aware that MRA Consulting did some work for local government shires in the Boomerang Alliance a couple of years ago looking at was a container deposit scheme beneficial for local government? And the answer was very clearly yes. 
so long as your MRF operators uh, can redeem deposits through the scheme. It increases the value of your containers in spite of the fact that many of the eligible containers will leave the scheme, about 17% will stay in your curbside bins, which makes the curbside bin more valuable. So some of the issues that Grant mentioned about the design and who's in and who's not are critical for the value uh, chain for local government, uh, and those design issues are very important. With that, can I introduce Jeff Angel? Jeff is the Executive Director of the Total Environment Centre. Uh, he's been the national convener of the Boomerang, Boomerang Alliance, uh, which is a not-for-profit representative group of 30 uh, groups. Jeff has been a strong advocate for container deposit schemes for many, many decades, uh, and has a wealth of knowledge. Could you join with me in introducing Jeff? Uh, thanks, Mike, and uh, <clears throat> thanks for uh, inviting me to be on the panel. Uh, and I can say that when the ministers and the Premier announced the uh, commitment to have a container deposit scheme by the 1st of July 2017 at Coogee Beach, uh, it was a little hard to uh, uh, digest after many years of campaigning, but there is now the odd moment of elation that finally we move somewhere. <clears throat> and I do want to congratulate the New South Wales Government for standing up to the attack ad bullying and threats from the big beverage company. Uh, those ads, uh, usually communicated in private, uh, have been one of the major forces that have prevented other governments, whether it was Victoria or Western Australia, from making a similar commitment. But the Baird government, with the enormous support from Rob Stokes, uh, stood up to them and announced the CDS. Oh, I've got to say that that has entirely changed the momentum of community campaigning and the uh, political environment at state level. Uh, when the government announced the scheme, uh, the ACT almost immediately said it would join once the process was finished. Uh, and we expect almost imminently that the Queensland Government will also join the New South Wales design process. The new Labor Government uh, came to power with a promise to investigate a state-based container deposit scheme <clears throat> and since then there's been uh, further discussions. Uh, that of course leads to uh, five jurisdictions with a container deposit scheme, WA, uh, TAS and Victoria uh, uh, omitted, but frankly not that passionately opposed to container deposits. And I will just correct Mike that the Northern Territory did lose the federal court case, but uh, that was on a process error. They hadn't got the mutual recognition exemption uh, that you can get uh, if you bring in a state-based scheme like that, and they fix that up and eventually got it and they're now fully operating and I'm sure Narelle will tell you about the enormous success that's having. having. Uh, I do want to say that a container deposit scheme is so much more than containers and litter. I know that some of the debate tries to narrow it down and therefore there are better options but what a container deposit scheme does is almost revolutionise uh, waste management of not only containers but other materials. It upcycles recycling uh, both in terms of getting a lot of glass out of the curbside bins which contaminate the paper and cardboard, devalue it, cause great expense at the recycling plants in order to get the glass out. Uh, secondly, to the, uh, to the extent of the amount of material diverted from curbside into reverse vending machines, it creates higher value material because it's not been contaminated in commingled bins. And that higher value has been recognised in all of the cost benefit analyses uh, uh, of, of uh, CDSs and various options. So it is upcycling curbside. 
And uh, as Mike mentioned, it does not do financial harm to curbside. Uh, secondly, it actually creates a viable business model for drop-off centres. You'll know that the government is funding a whole range, I think about 70 community-based drop-off centres. If they are part of the uh, receiver infrastructure for the bulk amounts of containers that have been collected, they will get handling fees and that creates a consistent financial basis for the drop-off centres which are currently completely subsidised by government. <clears throat> Thirdly, the commercial and industrial sector, which <coughs> excuse me, has quite a poor recycling record, uh, because they will want to get the 10 cents back, they will want to collect those containers that they haven't given to their customers, and they will want to uh, put them into the CDS system to get those, uh, the deposits back. That uh, supports a new collection infrastructure for commercial waste, and it would be a very simple matter uh, for the uh, CAFs and the food halls and the big hotels and that have giant uh, uh, catering establishments to put in their cardboard and plastic as well. So you are creating the business interest in a far better commercial uh, recycling system. Thirdly, it will massively help charities. We estimate they'll get about $60 million a year by proper involvement or full involvement in the system. And finally, with reverse vending machines, they're so sophisticated, they just don't, not only can take uh, containers, uh, they can take any number of non-drink containers, they could even take batteries. Uh, finally, I do want to say that in the ensuing New South Wales process, we have to make very sure that the uh, decision process is not based on a simple cost-benefit analysis number. We've lived through an enormous number of CBAs and their narrow basement methodologies which completely ignore all the multiple benefits that CDS has. <coughs> and the uh, Boomerang Alliance and Total Environment Centre is absolutely determined that we don't get back to that bean counter based decision. I think there are three big challenges left or at least uh, three bigger challenges, there's lots of others. Uh, one is what containers are in the system. That'll have a great bearing on the size and range of infrastructure and frankly the cost effectiveness of the system. The more containers in, the less costly it is. Uh, secondly, the role of retailers. Most, very, most of the very successful systems overseas have retailers, supermarkets as the convenient point of, uh, uh, of collection for the containers with reverse vending machines located there, <coughs> because that's where shoppers go and consumers go regularly. And thirdly, as suggested, the whole issue of contracts for councils and MRFs and the whole transitional process of changing that over. Thank you. <coughs> Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, our next speaker, and uh, of course, Narelle is operating profitably and well in Northern Territory, so I shouldn't have said that it's fallen over. It fell over. As you say, Jeff, it's now backing up. Uh, Narelle Anderson is the founder and managing director of EnviroBank Recycling, uh, who have a very successful program in the Northern Territory and elsewhere. And Narelle will give us a flavour of what it looks like from a commercial operator's point of view. Narelle. Thanks, Mike. Well, the question that um, we were asked to answer today is um, how is container deposit legislation going to affect me? And I know um, that that's the question that everybody wants the answer to. But what I'd like um, to talk about today is reposing that question and instead of asking um, how it's going to affect me, but rather um, look at how CDL is going to um, serve our communities and what's the opportunity um, for each of us. Because the problem of litter not only uh, impacts the environment, and as we heard last night um, from Waste Aid, there are many um, social impacts um, as well. And the facts really are um, quite simply this. If we keep doing things the same way, we're obviously going to end up in the same place. 
Um, so what's next and what's the first step? And obviously, um, container deposit legislation is the first step and the opportunity to design a legislation that can underpin, transform and reform um, is exciting but also troublesome at the same time. And I think nobody knows more about those troubles than Steve um, and his team. Um, because there are many different um, CDL um, legislations and schemes around the world. So the challenge that we have in New South Wales um, is what's the right scheme for us. Um, you heard from Mike that there certainly have been challenges in the Northern Territory and, I, and we're on the other side of um, those challenges in the Northern Territory and they were um, quite simply the beverage industry using um, a legal loophole um, to, to stop the scheme. We have a scheme that's been operating in South Australia for um, 30 years and you know it's been a very successful um, scheme. Um, but, they, but they also have um, some challenges and, in, and one of their challenges is that their recycling statistics, although very high, um, have been stagnant for a long time. Then we look overseas at um, countries like Germany um, that um, uh, Grant was speaking about and we, we see over there best in class um, uh, deposit uh, models and those models are all around um, using reverse vending machines and or um, some other form of technology. Um, and what, what technology does in a reverse um, vending, in a container deposit market um, rather, is um, add a level of efficiency and transparency um, to a scheme and make, and make uh, returning your containers uh, uh, more convenient. Uh, what, what, we, um, what we need to do in a container deposit market is really um, change behaviours. That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about changing, um, changing people's minds, changing processes and changing behaviours. Um, and to do that we have to uh, educate people and then after the education comes the reward or incentivise. And nothing I can tell you um, from my experience in the Northern Territory, nothing motivates people more than 10 cent coins. And the opportunity um, for charities uh, um, has been profound in the Northern Territory. It is staggering um, to see the amount of containers that come through uh, the recycling depots. And our position in the Northern Territory is both as a scheme coordinator, coordinator um, liaising directly with the beverage industry, um, but also as the largest operator of cash for containers depots in the Northern Territory. And we do that um, both in an or with an automated model uh, and um, you know, with a traditional model as used um, in South Australia. But interestingly, um, the other impact is, and, and you know, there's a lot of talk about um, the value for not-for-profits, but the value for, um, for the everyday um, family is also uh, really profound. And in fact, last week there was an article, um, or there was um, a report rather penned by one of the um, one of the agencies, one of the charity agencies in New South Wales that said, um, you know, more than 42% of Australian families actually live close or below um, the poverty line. Last night there was a show on SBS that was um, talking about Western Sydney and the challenges in Western Sydney. You know, there's no jobs, um, generation unemployment, people are finding it um, hard to make ends meet, um, etc. And, and so you ask the question, how does, you know, what's that got to do with CDL? Well, it's got a lot to do with CDL because in there lies an opportunity and an opportunity not just um, to clean up the environment because, you know, it is a little legislation after all, but it really gives opportunities for families and not-for-profits um, to self-fund and make a difference. And I want to quickly tell you a story about um, a gentleman in the Northern Territory um, that was an older gentleman and before cash for containers um, would go for his morning um, um, walk and, you know, um, then cash for containers um, started, you know, he didn't, he didn't have a job, he, he was, um, uh, you know, had a problem with his legs, so his doctor told him that he had to walk. Um, he'd do it begrudgingly. Cash for containers started, on his walk he started to pick up um, containers, take them off to the local um, depot in Catherine and started a conversation. And went back to his doctor two months later and his doctor said to him, you know, Mick, what's going on with you? You know, you're looking great. You've lost a few kilos and um, your leg's um, getting better. And his motivation was he was simply getting up, taking the dog for a walk and making a few, um, you're making a few dollars on, on the way. But it wasn't just the dollars that he was making from cashing in his containers. He then started um, to get back into community and he was having a conversation with somebody every day. Um, so there's all of those, uh, all of those benefits as well. From a recycling um, perspective, the results um, and the impact on a cash for containers market are staggering. 
Um, in terms of the commodity and the value of the commodity that comes back through a cash for container system, nobody can dispute that. It's first class recycling. It could go back into an aluminium can um, within a week or a PET bottle within a week. It's quite simply um, free from um, contamination and that's the process um, that technology have um, to keep the product clean. Um, you know, the whole thing about, um, about litter and, and resource recovery is about having a conversation with the consumer before they put it in the right bin, the wrong bin um, or otherwise. And adding an incentive um, to that obviously impacts that change. Um, so just um, for those that don't know, obviously a reverse vending machine um, is a machine that um, rewards and incentivises consumers. So you put your container in and a coupon or a voucher comes out and you get um, the opportunity to cash in those containers or, um, or some, other, um, uh, some other reward or opportunity. Um, so back to the question um, that we started with today, how does container deposit legislation affect me? And what I invite everybody to do is think not about how um, it's going to affect you, but how we can together architect a scheme that's going to deliver a great benefit um, to the community that we um, live in. Um, there, of course, has to be something in it for you. There has to be something in it for your business. There has to be something in it for every stakeholder along the way. After all, that's, that's how we change behaviours. But it's time, to, um, it's time for us all to agree um, that we have to make a change. And process, um, progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. Um, and for those that fear and have concerns about the impacts of CDL, um, after what we've seen in the Northern Territory, using, um, using technology with and without technology, I'm really confident um, that if you embrace the container deposit scheme that uses tech, um, technology as one of the ways to deliver and underpin that system, um, that you will change your mind. Thanks, Narelle. Uh, our next speaker goes without uh, introduction. Uh, Steve is the Director of Waste and Resource Recovery for the New South Wales Environment Protection Agency. Uh, by way of background, Steve has introduced a 400, the 465 million waste less recycle more program. They've done the regulatory amendments of the POEO in the last 12 months. He's the architect behind the levy, which is driving resource recovery in New South Wales and investment in infrastructure. And just as an aside, He's now leading the CDL architecture debate just in his spare time. Uh, and it all comes down to the architecture from here. So uh, Steve is a very, very important player in this debate. Uh, and it's great that he's spent, got the time to speak to us today about you know, what his thinking is around the architecture. Please join with me in welcoming Steve to the podium. Thanks very much for those kind words, Mike. Um, I think the other, the three previous speakers have really, I, I suppose, encapsulated uh, what the challenge is going to be um, going forward in introducing a CDS in New South Wales. I like the analogy of uh, putting man on the moon or Mars. I've been, but I've been describing it to people in the waste and resource recovery space. It's a little bit like us introducing the decimal currency system. Um, we've got two sets. We've got a system that's run, you know, to date, and there's a, a fairly significant change on the horizon. And how do we transition from one system to the other um, as seamlessly and as um, as painlessly as possible? So, as Jeff pointed out, the Premier and the Minister announced on the 21st of February at Coogee Beach that New South Wales would introduce some form of container deposit scheme by 1 July 2017. Um, they really want to, the, the, the philosophy behind this is really putting the power back into the community, giving the community the tools um, to participate more actively in resource recovery and litter prevention. And so part of that announcement was the, the government would want to see the introduction of a scheme that introduced reverse vending machines across the state to allow the community to participate more actively in that recycling and litter process, litter prevention process. Um, they also committed uh, very strongly, and it's been a sort of very strong ethos of the government, is to um, have a very extensive consultation process around this. And we have to do this quickly and efficiently as we can. But we do, we do need to sort of 
bring people together along on this debate. This is a debate that's gone on for 20 years that has been fairly divisive in its nature. People have formed off into various camps. Now that industry's made a decision, well, made, the government's made a decision, we now need to bring people together as part of this process um, to make it as efficient and effective as possible. So the big request I'm going to have from you guys over the next sort of six months or so is we will be coming out and consulting uh, extensively with local government and industry on the design of the scheme, and we're going to need your help. Um, we're going to need your information, we're going to need your data, um, we're going to need your guidance and advice. And the, the, if we can grab that information off you um, as quickly as we can, and in a sort of very open and transparent way, that will really help us design what the Premier has said to, to me about this system is he wants it to be the world's best system, um, but also cost effective. And so that's going to be a significant challenge. And I think as all three speakers have spoken about, it's not just the act, it's funny, when you start thinking about designing this, it's not just the act of having a piece of legislation, having a few machines, having some, some type of an incentive scheme to make people do something. Um, you, you are having to think, and it was I was alluding to it quite um, quite intensely in my speech yesterday around this idea of transformational change is you now start to have a conversation with the community about the types of materials that they produce, the types of waste streams they produce, how they want to engage with the system. Do they still want to engage with curbside? Do they want RVM machines? Do they want drop-off centres? That'll vary across the state. That'll vary across people, across the socio-economic spectrum. It'll vary across local government areas, and so we need to think about how we, how we're going to change those systems going forward. As Mike said, there, you know, there will be an impact. We know if there's a direct financial incentive placed on a beverage container, 70% of containers get consumed in the home. 83% of those make it through the curbside system. Is that system going to change? What's the speed of that change? How will that change affect the industry? How will it affect council contracts? Um, so there's a lot of thinking that's got to go around that changing of the, of the oh, is there going to be change to the curbside system? We think yes. How will that change play itself out? Are there other opportunities that can come in and fill that space? Then you've got to think about the business model. Um, and the business model in terms of how do you organise yourself to run this system as, a, as, the, as the system architecture? And then how do you make sure there's enough financial fuel in the system, the handling fee, to make sure that the system remains viable in the long term. And there's going to be a fairly heavy amount of background work being done on the building of the business model about how we put this thing together. Um, then you come down to around community change. And there was a great talk from Kate from Sydney City Council yesterday about their RVM trials. Um, for me, seeing the way the government's announcement has played out on container deposits, is a conversation starter around uh, waste and recycling more generally. The community is very interested in it, they're very engaged, but I think as Jeff points out, there's a great opportunity to start talking about other things we, we want the community to do in terms of waste avoidance and resource recovery. So there's a lot of work happening in the background at the moment. There's sort of a lot of people inside the EPA sort of, we're trying to look like a duck where we're paddling away crazily underneath to try and look calm on the exterior, but um, it's, we're certainly not calm about it at the moment. Um, we know this is going to be a big challenge, so really um, from both um, council and, and industry, um, we're going to come and lean on you guys fairly hard over the next sort of six months or so. Um, we're keen to sort of have the framework wrapped up um, later in 2015 for a more extensive public consultation. But the more open you are with us, um, and the more open I can be with you as we um, go forward and and uh, finalise the design, um, the better the design system will be. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Our last speaker is uh, Susie Senadisi. Uh, Susie is ex-EPA a few years ago, I, I found out this morning. She's now the strategy manager for the local government uh, New South Wales. Uh, local Government New South Wales, or the Local Government Shires Association, has obviously been a key advocate for CDS schemes for at least two decades, uh, and in partnership with Boomerang Alliance has really helped to move the public debate over a very long period. So uh, they are a strategic player and very important to uh, that 
local government is well represented, uh, as you are, by Susie. Um, join with me in welcoming Susie to the podium. Um, thank you. Um, I guess, yeah, I've got the unenviable task of um, following up with, after all these uh, terrific speakers. Um, I guess from local government's perspective and, and the way I've interpreted today's um, topic is how will it affect local government? How will CDS affect local government? And um, to start with, we're, we're obviously very pleased with the government's announcement uh, that it wanted to progress um, CDS. Um, and I guess looking into the reasons why local government is, is, is pleased with that um, gives us a bit of insight as to how it will affect councils. So um, first up, curbside recycling is uh, costly for councils and obviously then for ratepayers. Um, and it also doesn't address away from home recycling um, and, and containers that are generated outside that curbside system. Subsequently, councils play a very large role in cleaning up litter. Um, so containers make up about 30% um, of the litter stream by volume in New South Wales. So that's a, that's a fair chunk of, of the, um, that, that stream. And finally, uh, CDS, uh, which involves a deposit or a refund, shifts responsibility from um, both financially and physically onto the user of that product um, to behave responsibly. And that's instead of spreading that cost across uh, ratepayers who are paying at the moment through their curbside system. So um, as Mike mentioned earlier, um, the former Local Government and Shires Association had uh, um, uh, commissioned a, a study in 2012 and it showed that a CDS would represent a cost saving for councils of between 23 and $62 million annually. And that doesn't include the forecast savings from uh, litter management costs. And, and those are estimated at around the $18 million per year. So that's a substantial saving for councils um, and for the, the community and, and the ratepayers. Um, and, and again, shifts us more into that extended producer's responsibility space. So a key factor for councils, I think, will be, um, uh, sorry, a key factor in the design principles for a CDS for councils will be that containers collected via curbside, uh, whatever remains in curbside, can actually be redeemed. And, and again, Mike mentioned that earlier. Uh, there is a lot to think about in the design of the scheme. There's no doubt about that. Um, I think we all want an efficient system and um, minimising handling, but we need to balance that with ensuring that there's adequate access to the system across New South Wales for the community. So, you know, we need to make sure that it's not a Sydney-centric system. Um, and also for councils, the timing of the CDS implementation will be critical, um, in particular in light of existing contracts uh, and um, what arrangements are currently in place. So that will certainly be something that we'll be, you know, um, looking at and um, representing uh, through that throughout the next year um, or six months um, on behalf of local government. And I guess, although we do understand that there are lots of challenges and that it is a complex thing to design, um, as Jeff mentioned, this has been going on for 20 odd years. So we can't see this happen soon enough. Um, we actually would have um, urged the Premier to um, hasten its implementation. So we're very keen to see that. Whether it's, whether it's possible, we don't know, but certainly you know, we have been waiting on this for, for quite a long time, so we're keen to see it happen as soon as possible. Um, and yeah, I guess also as Jeff mentioned, social aspects of this are really important. Um, it, it is, the, the community has said that it, it wants this. Um, it said that through surveys that have been done by um, groups like Jeff's. Uh, it said that to, through our councils, um, through, through our councillors. So we, we can't underestimate um, how important it is for the community. 
um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susie. Uh, it's now over to you. We have until 10 past 11, so we have 25 minutes. I'm hoping for vigorous questions and answers and debate. So who wants to ask the first question? Uh, Alan from the Hillshire. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wonder if somebody from the panel could explain the intricacies of the, the, uh, the equipment. Just the, the, the details, the intricacies of the of the receiving equipment. Thanks. Oh, that's got to be a Norel. Is that on? Uh, Can you hear me? Do I need the microphone? So there's lots of um, different ways that technology plays a part um, in a deposit system, and we hear, we're hearing a lot of discussion about the 800 reverse vending machines. And a reverse vending machine um, comes in all um, shapes and sizes and depends on, on the application and the throughput um, of the container and, and the community that it's servicing. Um, so, you know, just in short, all of the technology, um, whether it's a single-use reverse vending machine or a machine that ha um, handles multiple um, commodities, the container goes in and the product um, is sorted um, using scanning the barcode. So in the Northern Territory, we use a souped-up version, if you like, of a reverse um, vending machine that can process 400 containers a minute. And again, it's reading um, barcodes and sorting by material type, and that's obviously giving the information back to the brands and the beverage industry that they need um, to pay um, that particular depot or coordinated the handling fees. Um, from a convenience perspective, um, located at a retail outlet, you know, that's a, a single um, feed um, container. And again, so it's, um, it's horses for courses. But what the technology has in common, and it doesn't um, really matter who the supplier is or the shape and size of the machine, um, it really is all about um, the data and the sorting of the containers. Uh, and then, of course, in the process of um, doing that, you get a nice, clean um, commodity. And um, in, inside those reverse vending machines, the material is also compacted, which obviously um, improves your logistics um, operation as well. Anyone else on the panel? Uh, sure. Is the equipment? Um, um, sorry. Yeah, just how robust is the equipment? Um, who provides it? And who maintains it? Thanks. Yep. So, in terms of um, how robust the equipment is, well, uh, you know, obviously, again, um, depending on the supplier. But this technology has been used in the European market um, for 20 years. Um, the technology itself um, is very robust. It's in, in fact, it's not at all complicated what's inside the machine. It's a, a, a mini compactor and, and a computer that um, and a camera that runs the barcode. Um, in terms of who is res um, responsible, again, um, that would depend on the commercial contract negotiation. Um, certainly at EnviroBank, um, we don't sell reverse vending machines. We provide a holistic um, service for the councils and clients um, that we deal with. Um, so we would service the machines, but it's different um, for different service providers. I'm sure that given that the state government's involved, there'll be some commercial process, tender, whatever, to determine who operates and maintains. Uh, James, over on the far side. And then down here at the front. Hello? Yep. Um, yeah, James Turnell, Armadale Jumeric Council. Look, I'm, I'm a big supporter of CDS myself, and I think our community certainly is. But one of the concerns we have is we've entered into a, eight, a 10 year contract with a local recycling company. Uh, they have the ability to, oh, as you would be aware, to sell on the, the commodity. They support a lot of local uh, employment, you know, up about 15, 16 staff. And their concerns, and, the, and our councillors' concerns, is the impact on their business model. And, um, you know, and we talk about handling fees and the like, but, you know, with the model contracts that we use for our, for our provision of services like that, has that been looked into as whether or not there could be any kind of claim back on council if they're um, severely jeopardised? Who wants to have a go at that? Jeff, Steve. Thanks for that, James. I think um, I think this is the level of detail we're going to have to get into with everyone. Really, we've got to understand it. Our initial sort of pass of the, around this that we did late last year is everyone. Everyone's going to be in slightly different spaces. They're all going to have slightly different contracts. They're all going to be in slightly parts of their life cycle. 
some have just signed up, some are coming to the end of their lives. Um, so we're going to have to tease that, that issue really carefully. Um, so any effect that we do have, we minimise it to the greatest extent we can. Now there are probably, there, we not promising anything here, doing this with our prejudice, but there are a whole range of um, legal mechanisms that could be put in place to, to cover that transition <laughs> process. Um, and that's why we, that was my plea really about we need to come and talk to you guys and, and hear fairly openly what your contracts say and don't say and, and how you think it plays out in your particular context. Um, I think when you do such a big system reform, it is like introducing the decimal system. There are going to be some winners out of it and some people that are not so. Uh, and we just need to manage that and, and mitigate that to the greatest extent we can. Jeff? Uh, I mean, in one sense, I'm pleased we're now talking about this rather than the ritualistic campaigning that went on for the last 12 years. Uh, we, we have held a few forums for businesses and uh, charities, etc. And one of the things that happens once they get over the initial shock that it's going to be a CDS if they have a contract is to start thinking about the opportunities and rather than, you know, that sort of unfortunate negative reaction and they may still end up in a bad place, there are actually opportunities to change their business model and take advantage of the greater throughput of higher quality containers. Possibly may need some changes to equipment, but it would be really stupid for a CDS uh, uh, to reinvent or recreate a whole lot of existing uh, transfer station and MRF infrastructure uh, uh, sites that we have. We need to change them, one, so they can fit into a CDS system and, frankly, uh, be part of an upgrading system from, I don't know what sort of MRF you've got, you're talking about, or collection system, from being dirty MRFs to highly capable source separation MRFs. Uh, and that is a very important conversation that Steve's trying to encourage and that uh, while councils might seek to protect themselves, there may be change of law provisions in their contracts that protect them from compensation. That's, you know, only half the discussion we need to get. The other half, the providers of those services, to think about some opportunities. Just on the work that MRA did, James, if the if 17% of containers stay in the recycling bin that are eligible containers and they are able to be redeemed into the scheme and get the 10 cents, then the MRF operators are better off, considerably better off, to the tune of about the $65 million that, that Susie mentioned. That would obviously be a benefit to them and through the contracting and tendering process over time, most of that value flows back upstream to the council because that operator is going to pass it through in order to win your next MRF contract. But as Steve mentioned, there are some transaction time, timing issues around some of that. But if the principle is adopted by government, and we don't know that yet, then in principle, the recycling bin is worth more money, not less. So therefore, you shouldn't get into transaction compensation issues. Uh, and of course, it will be a change in law. So all of your change in law clauses in your current contracts would be triggered. Um, there was a question down the front. You've just answered my question. Lovely. I love being pre um, prescient. Uh, a question. Hi. Uh, Mark Rawson uh, from Rawtech Consulting uh, in South Australia. Uh, first of all, congratulations, uh, New South Wales. Well done. I think you're, I think you're on, a, on a winner here. The um, uh, question was uh, probably to Narelle. Uh, again, South Australia, as you mentioned, has, has a fairly large uh, setup of traditional, what we would call traditional uh, container deposit um, recovery systems. Your experience in Northern Territory with both uh, reverse vending and you mentioned a traditional one, what, what's the split of uh, containers that are going through a, a, an RVM versus a, 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 a standard type depot? In the Northern Territory, um, 
we run an automated depot in Darwin and we would handle in that uh, Darwin more than 60% of the containers that are recycled um, through the Darwin market. And the Northern Territory is um, quite challenging, obviously, um, you know, in the nature of the um, territory. So the number of um, depots that operate in the Northern Territory, that material does come back through our depot eventually um, as we're one of the scheme coordinators. Um, but they're um, done manually as you do in South Australia. Um, in South Australia, though, we have taken automation to South Australia. Um, as uh, only last month, we automated um, two of the Scouts depots in South Australia. And again, um, the reason for doing that for Scouts um, was obviously to help them improve the efficiency of their business. Scouts run nine uh, cash for containers depots in South Australia and have been running that business for nine for nine years now, or um, nine years or more. And, um, and for them, the installation of technology was about um, improving the customer experience and obviously increasing their um, throughput without necessarily increasing their overheads. Anyone else on the panel? Uh, another question from the audience? Uh, Anne? Oh, sorry, Janelle was first. No, oh, sorry. Is that microphone on? No, wait for it, Jennifer. Sorry. Sorry. The They're packaging taping. covenant. There's obviously problems with it now, and a CDS will lead to some potentials with some material types perhaps being more likely to be covered under the packaging covenant than they would be under the under the CDS. Is this is this an opportunity to be having a look at some of the problems with the packaging covenant? <laughs> so the question was the, what's the interaction between the Packaging Covenant and potentially New South Wales CDS? Everyone get that? Yes and no. <laughs> the reality is that was going to... So where the, the current Packaging Covenant, Covenant expires 30 June. The Ministers, when they met in February this year, um, there was a discussion about the next phase of the Packaging Covenant. Um, so the Ministers have extended, or the process at the moment is to extend the covenant by one year, which has happened previously and before in the past. We're just going to vary the covenant for a one-year extension. And then the Ministers have asked that we bring back to them by the end of the year what the next, you know, Mark four of the packaging covenant would be. And there's a very active discussion that's happening um, at the moment between the jurisdictions and with the industry around what would what would the next generation of the packaging covenant look like? And should it be what its governance arrangement should be and what its focus should be, what its accountability and its governance arrangement? So all those things are on the table um, to really strengthen what the next generation of what the covenant should be. And from my perspective, we need a single national body to be the champion of sustainable packaging design. Um, each state can't do it and um, we need industry to take that lead on because that's where the change will happen fastest. And so that debate, that's why I said yes and no, that debate's happening regardless of the New South Wales CDS question. Grant? Uh, yeah, I'm on the packaging covenant. I should, by way of declaration, say I'm uh, also on the NPCIA and I'm, I recently resigned as chair of the NPCIA essentially because I had to go to Europe and couldn't do the job. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, I think uh, even uh, a Big Beverage recognised that there's a need for reform of the NPCIA. Uh, they have, to some extent, uh, lost uh, uh, their mandate and maybe wandered off, the, off uh, uh, or lost focus in terms of what they what they intended to do. Um, yeah, a very very active discussion behind the scenes. Extremely. Uh, uh, extremely uh, hard fought but quiet at this stage. Um, hopefully it's resolved and it's really going to be up to government to step up to the plate and sort that out ultimately because uh, get, asking a whole uh, supply chain, myself re representing resource recovery industry right through to uh, Big Bev and Food and Grocery Council and whatever to all agree on, on, uh, on a model is impossible. Just to put it in context, Grant, uh, local government subsidises curbside recycling. The figure is between 400 and 600 million dollars per year across the country. What does the industry contribute to the National Packaging Covenant? 
bugger all. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's about uh, $10 million a year. Um, uh, my uh, personal view is whatever uh, the new entity is, uh, that it needs to be a lot more. Uh, similar models around the world uh, have multiples of what industry puts in at the moment for similar schemes. Right. Sorry, Anne. Right. Um, look, west of the divide, um, freight of recyclables to the metropolitan areas for reprocessing has always been a challenge because of the high cost of freight. Um, a community that I'm very familiar with is, is Burke, which had a recycling service. The federal government changed the funding of wage subsidies. The whole service fell over because the, the revenue from the sale of the recyclables was completely consumed by the, freight of the, the, you know, the cost of freight. So to me and to the community that I'm working with, you know, CDS appears to provide a triple win. It will reduce litter, it will health Im Im improve the health impacts of the community because the kids won't get broken, um, you know, damaged feet, cut feet, and it'll hopefully create some jobs, so it's a win-win. But has that actually been the situation that's occurred in the Territory for more rural, regional, remote areas outside of you know, the main population centres of Alice, Catherine, Darwin? Yep, the challenge, as you rightly um, point out, and in the Northern Territory, um, is the tyranny of distance. And so we provide a recycling service into a place in the Northern Territory called Millingimby. Um, it's a two and a half char hour charter flight um, out of Darwin. Um, you know, it's closer to Indonesia than it is, um, you know, back, back to Darwin. And the way that they get their um, containers in and out and food is actually um, by barge. Um, so that's probably the most, you know, one of the most challenging environments in terms of um, freight is concerned. And uh, you know what we have done to uncover that because even um, even with um, the you know the cash for containers material, um, the cost of freight um, can be uh, overbearing. So that's really a commercial um, contract negotiation um, to be had um, with the service providers. You know about including um, transport or not including transport into those into those agreements that enable you to get that um, product out. Um, and that's what we've been able to do in the Northern Territory. Um, you know, there's some um, back freight opportunities. Um, so there's all sorts of um, ways to do it. It really is, and, and it's horses for courses because there's no two communities that are the same. You know, in the Northern Territory, again, it's probably a good place um, um, to trial a scheme because there's also lots of places in the Northern Territory that are not only um, remote um, by distance, but you have the wet season um, and the dry season and, you know, you can't get access at certain times of the year. So all of those things um, come into play, um, and freight is a big uh, is a big issue, um, but it's not one um, that can't be overcome um, with the right service providers and the right um, you know like-minded um, stakeholders. Jeff. Yeah, so, you know, that's that's what Cash for Containers does in um, remote. So, again, um, let me talk about Millingimby. So, the community of Millingimby, 300 people, um, one store, literally five jobs. Uh, and what Cash for Containers has done in that community is basically given everybody a job. And when we went into that community, I can tell you that um, PET bottles on the ground looked like snowflakes. There were so many of them. Um, and there's, you know, because there's no jobs, you know, um, obviously there's uh, nothing to do. The community was literally cleaned up overnight. And, and on our website, there is, in fact, um, a video of that um, community. Um, so essentially, everybody going out into the community and collecting those containers, um, that's a job because you're getting paid for that. So, you know, so there is some um, reward and incentive in that. Um, community, they get that reward and incentive back through that um, retail store that's run by the Aboriginal um, Land um, Progress Association. Um, so the recycling industry um, d delivers five times more jobs, I think, than any other um, industry, and certainly cash for containers allows people um, to do work um, in a non-traditional sense, um, which is going out and helping themselves and cleaning up the environment. I'm conscious of the time, I'm Jeff. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, different context, Spain recently in introduced uh, CDL, 13,000 jobs. This is very, very, very labour intensive. Uh, there is an important structural difference between the NT and for that matter SA where they have multiple coordinators and the proposed New South Wales scheme where we will have a single coordinator. And what that does is create the opportunity to equalise costs across the state. Now, it's not, you know, it's not that expensive in a, in a comparative sense to the running the entire system, 
Uh, but the handling fees, in a sense, there's a bit of cross subsidisation from the Metro. Uh, and that's, as the real may, may testify, the multiple coordinator problem causes enormous problems, uh, particularly in the NT, but we can solve that and make or well, offset the, the freight costs that you find west of the divide in New South Wales by a different structure. Great. We've got five minutes to go. Time for a couple more questions. Uh, Tony? Uh, thanks, Mike. Tony Wilkins. I'm with the Newspaper Works, um, representing all Australian publishers of newspapers and magazines. And one of the interesting things, and Jeff, you've been very kind with your time informing and guiding us on what it all means to our industry. And we've been involved, in, and Susie, I know you've been involved in some of the opportunities we've been trying to discuss as well. I was going to actually turn it around and say there's challenges and they're significant to getting this all in. But we've, as an industry, been looking at what the opportunities are. One of the, I don't know whether you know this, but 45% reduction in newspaper volume is the current figure pre-GFC or, you know, if you like, pre-digital uh, transformation. So volumes in bins have been dropping with newspapers declining. Uh, but the interesting thing is this will take glass out, which is a contaminant. If you can imagine halving almost the amount of newspapers and the amount of broken glass staying the same, that means doubling contamination. This will get us back into a situation where newspapers are worth a bit more because they're going to be less, it's going to be more income for councils, in other words, if it's higher quality. So one of the other opportunities we're looking at is, as an industry, we're talking within ourselves about there's going to be more space in bins, and that's another opportunity. And I was going to ask you about, we've talked about the challenges, but I think for local government it's nice to maybe even finish on what are some of the positives? Because there's great opportunities of using that extra space, for instance, to put things like uh, bags that contain batteries in, if there's a revenue stream there that local government can get. There's other things we can take out of landfill and use that space. But back at the MRFs, there's another opportunity again of being able to invest, because we've got lower contamination, in getting even higher quality recyclables out. So I, I can only see positives in this, by the way, and I'd like to basically hear your comment. Spot on. Uh, various uh, industry players have already been lobbying Steve to put plastic bags into that 40% saving in the curbside bin, uh, packaged polystyrene, not the beads, potentially. Uh, uh, Steve, did you want to make a comment? Do you want to go first, Grant? Yeah, sure. No? Okay, you go. Oh. Um, that was really what yesterday's keynote was about, was um, we've got this project going called 2025, and we're going to have, so you lie across a whole range of shifts and CD is going to be one of them, whatever the CD seems, looks like. We have this infrastructure of curbside recycling that exists and then you just got to start thinking to yourself, let's not think about the negative aspects of this, but a bit like yourself, let's think forward. What are the other things that are coming on the horizon? How can we use that infrastructure for the next great outcome in terms of resource recovery? And so that's the piece of work we're starting to do at the same time just to make life easy for ourselves. But I think it's too good opportunity to miss. Um, there are a whole range of things, you know, can you drop a small e-waste in at phones and I don't, I'm just thinking out loud here, but it's just, there are things in the house that we don't want into that res residual bin. We're, t we're trying to get as a clean organic stream out. But I think there are still things in the household that maybe we should think more openly about what a curbside collection system might be able to offer. Um, or to make sure that whatever moves through the curbside system is of a premium quality. So there'll be, there'll be that w unusual balancing act, but I think we have to, it's not a discussion we have to have straight away, but I think it's one I wanted to get everyone starting to think about. And then when we come and chat about it later in the year, then hopefully everyone's sort of starting, to, the welling of ideas will start to occur. Great. Yeah, what to do with legacy, how to optimise the opportunities from legacy assets. Um, the Premier wants a world-class system. God is intervening. The Premier wants a world-class system. A world-class system uh, is uh, a German rates of recovery effectively 98.5%. So I think some of the modelling that's been done doesn't account for that level of recovery through a CDS system. Uh, so we really do need to think about everything from bins uh, right through uh, the whole supply chain in terms of how to, what the opportunities are and, and in some cases what the costs are and how we ameliorate those uh, uh, to maximise the benefits or minimise the losses of, from legacy assets. 
and uh, if Kevin Trustum's in the room, if anyone's interested, Lismore do a brilliant job of putting plastic bags and phones and all sorts of things through their curbside system into their MRF, so it's a very interesting model for that, uh, that future. Uh, with that uh, very positive note, thank you, Tony, for asking the positive question. We might draw it to a close there. Uh, it's, thank you very much for all those very wide and diverse uh, questions and the answer from the panel. Could you please join with me in thanking the panel for their contributions?